Welcome to the stage, the Executive Director of the Sign Institute of, of Policy and Politics, Amy Dacey. Hello, everyone. Welcome. Thank you so Yes, excitement. Come on. This is a great event. I want to welcome you to the Sign Institute Distinguished Lecturer Series with Jamal Mashburn. We're so excited for you to be here. I want to thank our co-sponsors, um, certainly the Kogod School of Business. We have AU Athletics supporting us this and the Washington College of Law Sport and Society Initiative. And I really do want to thank, you'll spend the next hour or so with us, but can we please give all the staff from COGOD sign from the uh, events here, they put so much time and effort to make a really great conversation for you today. So I really want to thank them. At the Sign Institute, we like to say we convene, we communicate, we collaborate. We're a nonpartisan entity that brings sectors together to talk about the most important issues of the day. The Distinguished Lecture Series is a cornerstone of our sign programs and has brought astronauts and ambassadors, CEOs, prominent journalists, mayors, and others. And we are also so very proud of our, our collaboration with the Kogod School of Business, because with this series, we have collectively brought together uh, the CEO of Patagonia, Ryan Gellert, business leader and philanthropist, David Rubenstein, CEO of Booz Allen Hamilton, Horatio Rosanz, and now you, sir, to the stage. So we are very honored to have you with us. And with that, I want to introduce my friend, the Dean of the Kogod School of Business, Dave Marchick. Thank, thank you very much, Amy. Thanks for everybody for coming. We're going to have people trickle in. The men's basketball team just finished practice. They are going to shower, thankfully. <laughs> so uh, Jamal just uh, just had the opportunity to talk to them, and they had the opportunity to learn. I want to welcome all the parents and families here uh, for Family Weekend. And it seems like the rain has dampened a little bit of the uh, uh, turnout. But uh, we're on TV, and we're, we're going to have a great event. So um, let me recognize a few VIPs, Mark Duber, member of the Board of Trustees, former chairman of the board. Uh, Sarah Marie Martin is here. She's on the COGOT Advisory Committee. Our provost, Vicki Wilkins, is here. Our director of athletics, J.M. Caparo. And I want to thank my friend, Amy Dacey, who's incredible. We do a ton together and just collaborate, so thank you. Um, Jamal Mashburn, let me tell you a little about him and why we invited him to, to speak. Um, he had a wonderful basketball career. He was a star in high school. He was an All-American in college. He played in one of the most famous games in NCAA history when Christian Leitner hit the turnaround jump shot in overtime. Um, <laughs> too soon, OK. <laughs> he was selected as the fourth pick in the NBA draft. He was an NBA All-Star, went to the NBA Finals uh, with Jason Kidd. Um, and he's had an incredible career, okay? But why did we invite him to talk today? It's not because of his basketball career, but because of his full cycle of life. He learned very early that he wanted to uh, pursue a business career. And when, he'll tell the story, but when he was recruited, he went to every coach and brought a briefcase with him and said, I want to learn business if I also play basketball. Some coaches were receptive, some were not. He now has built a very, very significant business empire, okay? And if you think about pro athletes, okay, there have been, I think, around 70,000 athletes who have been in the NBA, the MLB, uh, the NFL, and the, and the hockey. If you take those and you say, who were the most successful at the transition to post-athletic life? You would have Roger Staubach, who went on to found a real estate firm sold it for $600 million. You'd have Bill Bradley, who became a United States senator and uh, ran for president. You'd, you'd have a few others, but Jamal Mashburn, Magic Johnson, who has a huge enterprise and big business, Jamal Mashburn has to be at the top of that list. And he's only 51, and he's not done yet. So I think his life story is of great interest to all of us and a model for us. With him today is also another friend of mine, Jason Kelly. Jason is uh, an award-winning journalist at Bloomberg. He's written two, he covered the private equity industry when I was at Carlisle. He mostly gave us positive coverage, but sometimes <laughs> some not so positive coverage. Um, he, just doing, just doing your job, right, okay. 
He, he's written two books, one on the private equity industry and one on the business of sports. Um, he now is a reporter covering the intersection between business and sports, and he co-hosts a television show and a podcast called The Deal with Alex Rodriguez. Now, Jason is the cooler one of the tandem, but uh, don't tell A-Rod that. But, <laughs> but thank you very much. This uh, interview will then become part of his podcast, um, and you can hear it on on his podcast as well. So thank you, Jamal, for being here. Thank you, Jason. I also want to introduce Jamal's wife, uh, Bailey. Uh, thank you for being here as well. Hi. Um, Dave, thank you very much. Uh, you know, what's funny is I, I want to give a little, little bit of backstory before we jump in. Yeah. Dave and I have known each other for a long time, and this was hatched over a lunch we had in New York um, over the summer. And as Dave told me, a lot of things, I of course knew who Jamal was. We're contemporaries from a linear perspective, not contemporaries in basketball. <laughs> um, but uh, as I came to understand and really deeply appreciate his business life and his story, as Dave alluded to, this was an interview that, that I obviously just couldn't turn down. And, and I'll tell you why, and, and it's a setup for where I want to go with you, Jamal, which is we are at this fascinating moment in the world of business and sports mm. where it is now a given. We just spoke with a, you just spoke with the, the basketball team here. We talk about NIL, name, image, and likeness, and everything that's going on in the sports world. We talk about this empowered athlete, whether it's Steph Curry or LeBron James. It's now a given that once you're in high school, you're starting to think about yourself as a brand. You're starting to think about yourself as a business. Yeah. That's not new to you. And no. that's where I want to start, yeah. which is this idea that from a very young age, you saw this arc for yourself. Yeah. And what's fascinating to me, and I think to this audience, is that it hasn't been a series of careers for you. It's been one career. Correct. Intertwined. Correct. How did that happen? What was the genesis of that back when you were a teenager that you saw that this was what you wanted to be? Um, I think, well, thanks to everybody for being here, first of all. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate this uh, opportunity and platform to chat. And thank you, Dave, for, for allowing me to be here. But for me, where it starts at is it starts with Helen Mashburn, my mother. Um, born and raised in Harlem. Uh, she's from Beckley, West Virginia. And my dad was a professional boxer. He fought Larry Holmes and Ken Norton back in the days. He was a heavyweight in the 1970s. And from a young age, I started to, I was very observant as a kid. And um, I was introverted. Um, and when my mother and father divorced, well, back in that day, it was more separation. Nobody could afford a divorce at that mm -hmm. time. There's nobody was splitting up anything. There was no assets to split up. Um, I started to realize that watching my father's career, he didn't make the right choices as a professional boxer. And I was a kid living in Harlem in the projects. And I had this idea of what a professional athlete is supposed to look like. Riches, uh, white can picket fence, you know, cars and all these different things. And that wasn't the reality I was living as a kid. And my mother was a bookkeeper for the New York City Housing Authority. She collected rent. Um, she taught me debits and credits at the end of the day at 9, 10 years old because she couldn't afford aftercare, so I would be in her office. So I watched her balance a book, and that's what she taught me. And I started to realize that, you know, at some particular point, if I wanted to leave Harlem, it was going to have to be through sports, academics, or the arts. And I chose sports, but I also chose sports for the particular standpoint that I wanted to have something to fall forward to, learn something, and then transfer that into a business career. And that came from me riding a train in downtown New York City and seeing people carry a briefcase. That was the inception for me. It was like, wow, what's in that briefcase? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, and years later, I found out that not many people have many good things in that briefcase. <laughs> um, um, it's for show, you know, um, or to carry a sandwich or whatever it is, you know. Um, and so that idea of getting on that train and watching people that look like me 
from 159th Street to transition all the way down to downtown New York City, because that's where I went to Catholic school at. I went to 72nd Street. And I used to see people leave the train and then get on the train around 103rd Street that were carrying a briefcase and wearing a suit. And I was the kid that wasn't intrigued by the suit because going to Catholic school, I had to wear a suit yeah. and tie. Um, and um, so I was always curious about that. And then I started to look at my dad and look at his lack of preparation, um, not necessarily for the sport, but for what was to come. Yeah. And um, I didn't want to be a guy that just lived in the moment. I, I thought of things long term. Um, and that trauma of my mom and dad separating and her putting me in Catholic school really ignited a, a passion to really learn and to really follow my dreams. Now, it's, 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 there's a lot of things that go into it that you have to address but um, from a personal level. But that was kind of my road and that was kind of the, the spark mm -hmm. that did it. And then my mom said something to me, and um, it was very interesting. Um, and I was sharing this with Bailey one day. She's, I was probably about six or seven years old, and we're walking out the project door, and there's a trash man. You know, they stand on the back or whatever, yeah. and, and they pick up trash or whatever. And my mom was like, that's what you're going to be. And I'm like, huh? I, and I looked at her and said, no, I'm going to be rich. And she was like, well, what do you mean? And then I had, years later, I had to remind myself on why my mom said that. It wasn't to put me down, but it was from the era that she was from, that you get a city job, yeah. you get a pension, and you live out the rest of your life. And what she was really saying to me was have a backup plan and have something steady. Right. And I challenged her to say, well, backup plan sounds like failure. Why don't I have something to fall forward to? Mm-hmm. And so that started the whole, the whole journey for me. Oh. And so that briefcase becomes this symbol, it, almost an allegory for, for where, you, where you go. And Dave alluded to this. It becomes a centerpiece of your college search. Mm -hmm. And you're going to talk to coaches. And I'll fast forward a little bit because there are so many things I want to get to. Essentially, a lot of coaches say, yeah, OK, you're here to play basketball. Yeah. But one coach says, OK, briefcase, you're in. Yeah. Tell us about that moment. Um, so I was highly recruited. Um, I started playing basketball at 10 years old and because um, I was originally, originally a baseball lover. But I found out quickly that my first business decision was that I wasn't a good baseball player. OK. <laughs> um, and I switched to basketball. And why I switched to basketball was I tried out for a baseball team and I got cut on a spot. And, you know, me and my wife, we talk about feelings all the time and different things like that. She was like, how did you feel? And I'm like, OK. That here doesn't we go. sound like anyone. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah. no, 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 no. Like, here we go. OK, how do you feel? So I started to reflect. And what I felt was I felt the disappointment of not making it. But I took it one step deeper on why I didn't make it. Mm. And what was my participation in not making it? And in that experience in baseball, it wasn't my participation. It's just that I didn't grow up geographically in a place that some people can teach me baseball. Ah. Didn't have it. Didn't have the mentors. Didn't have the resources. Uh, nobody in my neighborhood really understood the game. They grew up on basketball and other things. And so for me, after getting cut, I made a, I made a pact with myself that I would never be unprepared for an opportunity again in life. And I was at 10 years old because I didn't want to feel that feeling anymore. I was feeling a disappointment and, and just all these different things. And I decided that particular day that I was going to go outside in the back of my projects. We had a basketball court and I played by myself. I'm very visual. So if you show it to me, I can pretty much learn it and I just rep it out. So I spent three years by myself just playing. I didn't even own a basketball. It was a community basketball. Mm -hmm. First one that, that, uh, that, that comes out brings the basketball. The last person keeps the basketball. And the next day, that person brings the basketball out. So I always found myself to be the first and the last. And that's how I started. And um, then I got progressively good at it and uh, tried my wares on the national scene. And that's where I met a good friend of mine, Grant Hill, and through Janice Hill, met, met Dave. And, um, I just started to play with older guys, and then I started to ask them questions. 
And the, one of the questions I asked was, how do you pick a university? How do you pick a college? Yeah. And I'm 15 years old sitting there with 18 year old guys and they're telling me, and we're on a trip to Vegas playing out there and they're telling me, oh, you know, I like the school. I like the colors. They're paying me. Uh, um, we're going to be on television. And I was like, it got to be a better way to do this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so what I decided to do was flip it on his head. Instead of the college coaches recruiting me, let me recruit the school with certain criteria. Yeah. And the criteria for me was you had to have a, a pro coach who either put kids in the pros or coached in the pros. Um, <clears throat> How receptive were they to my idea of not just being a basketball player, but being a business person? And not just through university classes, but relationships, real world uh, things. Um, and also honesty. You know, can you be honest with me? And when it got to my years, at 17 years old, and I became a senior in high school, and they start to do home visits. I had Hall of Fame coaches from, I mean, some, some are coaching till this day. I won't mention any names. And, um, they laughed at me when I told the briefcase story. And uh, I remember that feeling of being cut at that particular time. Right. Kind of triggered that a little bit. And so then a, a college coach walked in. And after that, I stopped letting college coaches present what they wanted to present. Like they would give you the history and tradition of the school. And I said, I didn't care less about that. And they're like, what do you mean? I'm like, if you're sitting in my living room, that means you've deemed me valuable enough that we're going to win games. Yeah, they're pitching you. Correct. So yeah. let's let's get that out of the way. How can you really help me? Yeah. This is what I want to accomplish. I want to be an NBA player and I want to be a carry a briefcase. And Coach Rick Pitino, when he took the job at the University of Kentucky, he only had three scholarships because they were on probation at the time. And he said, Jamal, I can help you. He fit the criteria. He coached the Knicks previously. Right. Um, um, he was honest with me. He said, hey, listen, when it's your turn to turn pro, I'm going to let you know. Okay. And on your briefcase thing, we're going to work on that. And at the end of your college career, if it's four years or whatever it's going to be, we're going to sit down and hire a business manager and agent and work through the process. And he was the only one that kind of gave me a semblance of a little bit of a plan. Mm -hmm. All the other ones didn't because they were all concerned about how I impacted their university as opposed to how they can impact me. Right. You know, and um, so that, that that was pretty much the start of it. So I, I want to talk about that key decision of, of hiring your agent, because I think that that puts you on a very distinct path as well. Before we get to that, as you're talking about this, and I, I dare say other people in this room share this with me, a lot of us have known 10-year-olds, and <laughs> I've had some 10-year-olds, and... Uh, they don't have those sorts of thoughts. Like, yeah. what was it about you or your upbringing? Was it your mom who sort of like yeah. shaped you to think like that? Because you're talking about some very advanced things that, you know, like most 10 year olds are like, can I have a ring pop? Yeah. You know, like, I mean, that they're not thinking uh, about. I asked for that too. Okay, you know? all right, good, good. All right, that makes me feel a little so, bit yeah, better. Uh, okay. Yeah, so, uh, so as we were chatting uh, back in the green room there, um, and we were talking about different perceptions of, and we were having a conversation about, as you get older, you remember how you were as a kid and how your parents chatted with you. And then you move into their position. And now you're chatting with your kid the same way with the same fears that your parents had. So to me, it's all, all the same. And when my mom and dad separated, my mom just sat there and just told me cold and sat me at the dinner table and said, I can no longer talk to you as a young kid. Mm. I, I just can't because she's a single parent. We're in Harlem. Um, when I walk out, my I lived on the eighth floor. When I walk out, you can smell marijuana. It wasn't legal back then. Um, you can smell people in the hallways. You can just just a distinct smell, concrete. Uh, mm -hmm. It's just a distinct, uh, dingy smell that you smell and smell and felt. And um, she was worried about my safety, essentially. You know, um, my father was a professional boxer, but he transitioned to being an NYPD officer. And living in the projects, if your dad is an NYPD officer, a lot of people don't mess with you for a lot of different reasons, because he's a cop. When he leaves the house, now you're on your own. Right. So my mom really taught me about and chatted with me about real world things. She took me out of Harlem and exposed me to 
museums. Uh, she would take me to restaurants, white tablecloth restaurants, and she couldn't afford to order, but she would allow me to order so I wouldn't be afraid to order off a menu. Right. And you would be surprised how many kids and some things that we take for granted as adults that other kids don't have an opportunity to be exposed to. Mm -hmm. You know, so my mom always chatted with me as an adult. So my language and diet for what I was want to receive or wanted to participate in changed right. completely. It's yeah. just, I no longer, I read comic books, but I read them differently. You know, not just looking at the pictures and imagining something, but actually reading the words and then interpreting what it actually was stating, you know? Um, so that really shaped me to um, dream bigger. Yeah. And also one of the things that she taught me was to have courage. That's one of my core values. I'm unafraid, you know? Um, I couldn't make it to the NBA if I was afraid, you know? There's a certain level of fear as you're going after something that you have to overcome. And, um, you know, nobody in my neighborhood was ever a professional basketball player. Didn't know many professional athletes. I knew my father as a mid-level boxer or something like that, but I had no blueprint. So yeah. my mom was the blueprint to give me those core values to be courageous to go after it. And so that clearly sets you up to make a different series of decisions, not just going into college, but, but coming out. Yeah. So you hire your first agent mm -hmm. who, and I did a little prep um, with your wife, um, who totally set me up with, for this uh, question, so thank you. Um, of course. Which is, <laughs> yeah. um, listen, you gotta report, you hey, gotta man, figure it out. <laughs> um, but that's a key decision because this is a guy who is not the traditional NBA agent, right? Yeah. So tell us about that because you know everybody in this room has had to hire someone or work with someone to help them do something. You hired him for a very specific reason. Tell us about that. Yeah, so it goes back to um, Rick Pitino. Um, Dave mentioned a basketball game I played in Kentucky against Duke. Uh, people regard that as probably one of the best college games ever, um, depending on what side of the table you sit on. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but, um, <laughs> I believe your buddy Grant Hill threw the inbound Yeah, pass. I, I, I would that consider right? he yeah. thinks it's a great game. You know? <laughs> um, um, but no, in all seriousness, I, we learned a lot because that was the first time Kentucky could be back in the NCAA tournament. Right. Um, and we went that far to the Elite Eight. The following year, we went to the final four and we lost to the Michigan Fab Five. Mm -hmm. So Coach Patino was honest with me. And after my sophomore year, after that game against uh, Christian Leitner, I got invited to play against the first dream team. That was Magic Johnson, Larry Bird, Michael Jordan. Um, we were part of a select eight of us, myself, Grant Hill, Penny Hardaway, just to name a few. And we wow. beat them on the first day. And we were the only team to beat them, even though they didn't want to give us credit for it. But <laughs> we beat them. And Coach Patino came back and he was like, um, I was taking summer school courses probably about, this is probably about, I want to say in maybe July or something like that. And so he pulled me in the office after that week spinning out there with La Jolla San Diego with the dream team. And he said, remember when I recruited you and you told me to be honest with you? I said, yeah. He said, well, today we're going to announce that you're turning pro before your junior year starts. Wow. And after the season is over, depending on how far we go, hopefully go to a championship, we're going to hire an agent and a business manager. I said, can I call my mother? And he said, yeah. You know, and then that, that uh, next hour, we just announced it. And his strategy on that was, let's announce it and control control it rather than other people throughout the whole season kind of always asking the question, are you turning pro? Right. So long story short, we lose to the, the Fab Five and um, hire an agent. Um, and then there's four other people that come into the office, the Coach Patino's office, and they're business managers. Three of the four never listened to what I want. I'm 19 years old at the time. Um, and um, what I wanted was I want to retire after my first contract and step into a live active business. But at 19, you have no, you know, grasp of that concept. I know what the big idea is. Don't yeah. know how to execute it. Three of the four never listened. They chatted about their portfolio and what returns they were getting for their clients and different things like that. They were Morgan Stanley, this and that. 
one guy walks in, his name is Rick Abar, and he's 33 years old. And he says, I don't know what I'm doing here. Ooh, interesting. <laughs> <laughs> It's a hell of an introduction. Yeah. Great introduction. And um, he goes, Coach Petit wanted me to meet with you and different things like that and discuss possibilities of working for you and with you as you move forward. And um, he says, what do you want to accomplish? And I said, I want to step into a live active business. He sat back and he was like, okay, <laughs> you know, what does that look like? And I said, I really don't know at this particular time. And then I said, um, looked at his resume. He had his master's in a in finance, and he was also a CPA as well. Mm. And he told me everything that he couldn't do. And um, I said, hmm, that's interesting. Hired him on the spot. And um, Why? I hired him on the spot because, first of all, my core value is honesty. That's my first thing. If you can't be honest with me, then we can't work together. I don't care if we're going to be successful or fail or whatever it is. I'm just not going to be able to participate. Um, and I said to him, and one thing he was willing to do that the others didn't have the capacity or didn't get a chance for me to get to that particular point, teach me everything you know about finance. And he said, interesting. And he said, I said, can you do that? He said, yeah. I said, what about accounting? He said, yeah, no problem. So when I hired him, we learned on my own cash flow statement, balance sheet, and that's how I learned. And I learned through real life deals. Right. You know, my first investment was Outback Steakhouse. And that was through a relationship through Chris Sullivan. And um, he went to University of Kentucky, University of Florida as well. And he got wind that I wanted to participate in business. So I became an LP in Outback Steakhouse. And we opened up 34 stores, eventually sold that. Um, but it was the relationship. It was somebody Sorry, that was did you say 34 Outback Steakhouse? That's yeah. a lot of Outback Steakhouse. Yeah, it's a, a lot, lot of Bloomin' Onions, man. A lot of Bloomin' okay. Onions, yeah, right. a lot of Bloomin' But if you know doing business in California, you know you already got to go. You know? yeah. But um, at the end of the day, that's how it started. It started with that transparency and that honesty and really telling him what I didn't know. Right. Rather than what I do know. And vice versa for him as well. And um, that's where it started. And um, it, it seems like that that is a theme that you've had throughout your career, too. And, and this notion, which I think has, as I alluded to at the beginning, sort of come into vogue but was not obvious then, which is this notion of being a partner and a principal mm -hmm rather than just an asset, and yeah. rather than someone who's like, yeah, I'll slap my name on that. This notion of being not just engaged, but invested. Yeah, and I think sometimes there's a, if we go back in time and look at the athlete, a lot of times, and I was sharing this with um, at the other event that we were at earlier, people don't necessarily look at the athlete as a human being anymore. Mm. Uh, they look at them as a dollar sign or something that they couldn't attempt to do or they see the life through their eyes or whatever it may be. But the realization of it is, is that overnight for an athlete, once they get drafted or once they sign their marketing deal before they get drafted, which I did with Fila, was you instantly become the patriarch of the family. Hmm. Not that you've earned it financially. You're, 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 you're the guy that everybody comes to. And for a 20-year-old kid who hasn't got their life in order, it's a very difficult position to be in. You become the savior of not only your family, but your whole community, essentially. And that's where a lot of guys go wrong and they try to save everybody. Hmm. My mom told me something one day and it, it, it rang true throughout the course of time. She's like, have you ever been on a plane? She knew I had, I'd been on a plane, but she was just using that to, as a setup. You know, you can only carry one carry-on bag. I was like, yeah. She said, why are you trying to carry all your friends with you then? And I said, huh, that's a great, great um, business. And then she went on and she said, you know, at the end of the day, if somebody's going to sit next to you and we expanded on it, they have to add value and be able to pay for their own seat on the plane. That's how I looked at it. So then as I started to look around and building teams and adding people to an organization, I started to assess what value do they bring to the table. Things mm -hmm. that I can't see and things that I can see. Intrinsic, intrinsic value, basically. And um, that's how I've, I've, I've just operated on that particular plane. We all have to be valuable and an asset to the particular team. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I like to score. If I'm putting together five basketball players, 
I'm not putting five of the four of the scorers with me because that means I ain't getting the ball. Right. <laughs> right. So I'm putting together a guy that can pass, yeah. a guy that can block, a guy that can screen, a guy that can rebound, probably another score to diversify it, you know, and different things like that. But, you know, you just have to know in your mind of where you are today, what do you know, be self-aware about things you possibly don't know, and try to hire people alongside you that want you to win. And not from a selfish standpoint want you to win because it's, you're a part of a team now, you right. know, at the end of the day. And um, I think sometimes the athlete is put in a position where they have to solve everything for all people in certain communities. And it's unfair to them because they don't have a chance to grow. And when things go, go south, you know, they're looked at as a pariah or a failure. Yeah. But, and so, I mean, that happens at 19, and, and obviously there have been a few years inter intervening. As you look back, what are the one or two sort of signature deals where you look back and say, all right, that's, that's a Jamal deal? Like, that, that's the one that really either set you on a different path or was a measure of success? Like, what are the ones when you go back and say, all right, that was, that was one that really made a difference in how I think about my business empire? I probably think, I, I mean, I can give you a couple, but the ones that kind of resonate with me personally is probably the deals that I didn't do. Hmm. Um, and, uh, and the deals that I walked away from. And one of the deals I walked away from was, uh, I had two years, $24 million from the New Orleans Hornets to stay at the end of my career, and I chose to leave. Uh, they had it on the table, and they, they couldn't quite understand. Everybody thought I walked away because of injury. That was partially part of it. The other part of it was I was actually bored. I felt like there was a glass ceiling. I'm sure there's people in this audience, and when you're trying to upwardly move throughout a company, there are certain glass ceilings that you come across and that you hit your head on, and you have to make a decision. Do I stay or do I go and go somewhere else or build something or whatever it is? And that was my time when I decided to leave. And it was for the reason that, you know, I sat there at a charity event with the former owner of the New, Ol uh, New Orleans Hornets at the time, it's mm -hmm. now the Pelicans. And, um, you know, when you're the star player, you sit at an event, at a charity event, and you're sitting with the owner and the president or whatever. And he, I was in the car business during the same time. I, mean, I was a Toyota dealer. And uh, I got wind that he was a car dealer as well. And I tried to engage him on car business, and he wouldn't have a, he wouldn't chat. Just wouldn't chat. It reminded me of that college coach who laughed at me. Yeah. So it's another trigger. Yeah. So. Don't uh, trigger this guy. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, I'm just saying. Um, and I decided at that particular time that my time would have been used more valuable not playing another NBA game, but going out and continue to build my operating company. Yeah. Because I realized at that particular point, there would be no amount of money that they can pay me to satisfy my entrepreneurial spirit. And I just no longer want to do it anymore. The conversations in the locker room just got bored. I mean, I just got bored. I mean, I remember chatting with guys in the locker room. I can get you an outback for $75,000 for a unit. And a guy, like, he's asking me. I said, yeah, I can help you out with that. Then the next day he comes and says, you know, me and my wife don't want to do that. We want to buy a car from you. I'm like, a car? And then he had these whole list of specs that he wanted. The car turned out to be $150,000. Right. And the car is depreciating asset. Right, right. But he went for that. Yeah. <laughs> and you're like, cool, man. Like, he's, here's he's your car. And he's no longer a teammate or a friend. Right. You know? <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> but, I mean, at the end of the day, you know, I just felt like that was one of the deals that kind of was a tipping point for me that I didn't take. I think the other one was um, we were in a, me and my business partner, we were in a, a plastic and injecting molding company. And, um, you know, during the 2008 recession, the, uh, uh, everything collapsed for the minority supplier. We were a tier one supplier to Toyota. We did the cup holders and the emblems for Toyota based out of Georgetown, Kentucky. And, um, you know, we didn't, we had to pay back debt and one of our partners walked away. And me and my business partner, we went ahead and paid $7 million <laughs> Um, for that debt, and that's when Toyota looked at us and said, hey, we want to be in business with y'all even further. Interesting.
And that's how we got into jam distribution. And we supply probably 40,000 uniforms to Toyota manufacturing a year. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, you look at a deal that didn't work, that actually turned out positive because you lived up to your obligation. Right. And that's how I've always looked at it. So to me, it doesn't matter the numbers. It's, it's actually the impact that you have that leads to something else. That yeah. I kind of value. So those are the two opportunities I kind of think of. And I, in my mind, I always think of the ones that I fail at that lead me to somewhere else. Right. Yeah. And so, you know, we're here on a college campus. We're, we're thinking about the changing nature of college education, college athletics mm -hmm. specifically. NIL was not a thing, at least in, in terms of compensation. Let me check that. Yeah. In terms of legal compensation. Correct. Um, Correct. Yes. when you were coming up and, and really has just recently shifted to that. As you look at that landscape, as both a, a former college athlete, former pro athlete, and a business person, what do you make of it? And, and like, what do you think happens next? Well, uh, we have a son that plays at Temple University, and he's been playing college athletics basketball uh, since 2020. Um, he's doing his fifth year at Temple. Um, you know, it was interesting about NIL, and I've seen it by being actually a part of it rather than on the on the outskirts of it because uh, he participates, and I also see it through the eyes of a different economic lens. Yeah. Um, my son didn't accept NIL money his uh, first, I want to say, first two years, uh, two years, and why he didn't was he started to understand what his true value was. Interesting. Um, and didn't want to give that up, wanted to control it more than anything. And that was based upon the conversations that me and him had since he was nine, going through his journey. Yeah. Um, so I'm the mom now. You know? the, right. <laughs> yeah. the honest take, chats. Yeah, yeah, the yeah. honest to talk to you as an adult. Um, and I think it's, I think they're going to have to figure out how to make the athlete a part of the pie rather than just segment it to somebody else to be a conduit to a pie of, of revenue. Name, image, and likeness. I think the NCAA just threw that out there so they, you know, for litigation purposes, because they had no controls around it mm -hmm. at the end of the day. Um, and I just think that, I often think that, you know, we're going to get to a particular place where you're probably going to have probably 50 Division I schools powered by college football right? that are going to be participating in high-level, I would say, super conferences. Yep. And then everybody else is going to have to try to figure it out. you know. And um, it's unfortunate. I think it's going to take a lot of scholarships away. Title IX is going to be an issue right. for a lot of schools. Non-revenue driving sports. Um, the institutions on what the reality of why they're there is now coming into question. Sure. Are you just a money driver or uh, to grab tuition, or are you an institution of higher learning? Mm -hmm. I think there's going to be some sort of rub there eventually. And also, I think the kids are going to come in later um, as college athletes. I think you're going to see a trend of a delay of college kids from an age perspective. Ah, interesting. I think they're going to be older coming in because what kids are going to realize is if I'm not going to be an NBA player or an overseas player, I got to maximize my revenue in college. Right. The best way to maximize my revenue in college is not being a 17 year old freshman. It's coming in at 19 years old and being physically ready. So I think the post-grad schools, that bridge before you get to right. college, you're going to see a lot more kids do that. Interesting. You know, huh. um, because if you think about it, if you got kids that have the ability to transfer, you're going to stay at one school, create your value. There are going to be other participants that want your value, especially if you're at a lower level, to pull you up, and they're going to pay you more. Yeah. So most kids are going to get to that. It's a radical transformation of the model. You know what? It, in, in the reality of it is, it's actually the reverse of what the NBA is right. doing, where they want them younger. Yeah. But then they figured out now that we have to open up a G League because some of these kids are not ready, and then the product suffers, you know? Um, so I think there's going to be a lot of... Uh, 
I call it all professional sports at the end of the day, you yeah. know? And I think sometimes these collectives where they donate money to universities and different things like that, I mean, I know of a kid that played with my son and he decided to transfer and they didn't give him his NIL money, the rest of it. And what upset me about that was he was a kid that really needed it. Mm -hmm. His family was, that, that was a part of what they were living off of. Right. And the fact that he decided to transfer from school because somebody got pissed that he's no longer staying there, he didn't, they didn't live up to his obligation. But a kid like that, what recourse does he have? Yeah. Is he going to hire an attorney? Probably not. He's probably just going to have to walk away and different things like that from it. So I think things are going to ultimately drastically shift and change. Yeah. All right. I'm going to open it up to, to questions to you guys in just a second. You better have some good questions or else you're going to hear from Dean Marchick and I, I, you don't want that. Um, I've been on the other side of those phone calls from him, <laughs> believe me. Um, but last question from me uh, to you is, so what's the next, you don't have to like tell us some confidential deal you're working on, but what, like, what's your next aspiration? I mean, this has been an incredible journey thus far, but I think if there's one thing we have all taken from listening to you over the last few minutes is, you're a man with a plan. Mm -hmm. You are looking ahead. You're always thinking about what's next. So what's next? Oh, I think what's next for me is, um, you know, I'm going to continue to grow in the car business. Uh, we're Lexus and Toyota dealers. We're in uh, four different states. So we'll continue to grow in that particular space. Um, I see that space changing as well. Mm -hmm. COVID has really impacted that um, and how customers want to get engaged and what they want, how they want it, when they want it. Um, you know, I love the waste management business. I think that was an interesting business because it fits my personality. And it also fits what my mother told me. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, my God. She saw the yeah, future. You were the in future. the garbage business. Yeah, in the garbage business. <laughs> um, um, not necessarily collecting it. But yeah, you know, right, yeah. But, um, You're collecting something. Yeah, 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 collecting yeah, something. yeah. You know, um, I still want to grow in that particular space. But I think for me, ultimately, is um, how do I continue to make an impact? I'm not the guy that wants to go out and do a bunch of podcasts and do all those different things. Um, I like to impact people on a one-on-one. Wow, one shots one. fired on podcasts. No, 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 no. I mean, no. come on. <laughs> Podcasters no, here are no, no, taking no. offense. No, that's just my personality. Okay, you know what I mean? It. My personality is not one to be out front. Yeah. It's more or less to be behind the scenes. I was a communication major in college. And Rick Pitino was like, why don't you take business courses? I said, why? And he was like, you want to carry a briefcase? I said, well, I think I'm going to learn that out there, but I have to have the ability to communicate yeah. what I want and so, or, or, or what I want to translate or transfer. And so for me, it's probably making an impact. Um, I do see, you know, one of the issues that I, I'm contemplating and I've been a part of and doing things is trying to solve and participate in this housing crisis. Mm -hmm. And people start in their starter homes. I grew up in the projects and different things like that. And I was a rental model, you know? And I think home ownership is a great pathway to um, creating wealth, a generational wealth where you can pass things down to kids and different things like that. Um, so I wanna be a part of that. And then also with my kids as well, I'm kind of trying to set them up in a particular way where they have options. And I'm a big believer in probably going after and figuring out what you don't like yeah. rather than what you do like, you know? Um, so having them work in the business and see what they like. And I, I'm, I'm a big proponent in that I think you need young energy in the room in the world that we live in today um, to sustain you in a lot of ways yeah. and to also see the world from their perspective. And, um, you know, I started to understand that in the car business. You know, in Lexus, they wanted to do a program called Lexus Plus, a national program, but they had to have all dealers buy into it where you don't negotiate a price because millennials don't want to negotiate a price. It's, they have all their information and that's different from a car for a car dealer, yeah. you know, um, because you think of the guy with the cigarette, the pot belly, you know, how am I going to get yeah, you into yeah, this exactly, Lexus exactly, today? Exactly. Yeah. And I think that's changing. So I would like to be in the forefront of, you know, how to use technology to create a better experience uh, for people. 
you know, and also the back of the house as well. Right. Um, I'm not as much into eliminating people as much as I'm eliminating lazy people. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, that don't want to use tools or want right. to think of an old way of doing things. Um, I'm a big believer in just trying to make an impact. You know, yeah. I think for me, you know, um, putting a dollar figure on it or, or being a corporate raider, that's not really important to me. It's how do I make an impact? And it's almost like a coach having other assistant coaches and then his assistant coaches become head coaches. Yeah, right. And you're part the of tree. That, the tree. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so that's what I'm kind of looking at more now. Not necessarily legacy because I don't want to do that part of it. I'm too young for that. Yeah. But, <laughs> um, um, but I want to make an impact. Yeah. And we'll see what, what that comes to be. All right. Uh, let's open it up to questions. Raise your hand and they will bring you a mic right here. Thanks a lot. Uh, you've made a lot of great decisions, but inevitably as parents, as adults, we make decisions that don't go so well. So yeah. I'm curious, uh, particularly maybe over the last 10, 15 years, decisions, one or two that are memorable enough where it didn't go as you would have liked and what you learned from that. As far as being a parent or, or anything, kind of big one or two lessons that didn't work out well. Um, you know, I don't, I kind of start from the seat of, um, yeah, things might have not gone the way I've expected them to go, but how often do they? <laughs> um, I would say my biggest, um, one of my biggest lessons that I learned uh, through failure, something that didn't go well was when I went through that Jackson Plastics, it was a, that molding company that I was talking to you about that I mentioned. That gave me a great understanding of how to pick a partner. Um, we weren't the operator. And we relied on somebody else to be the operator without really understanding or learning the business. And so we got impacted by passing that off to somebody else. So moving forward, what we've done, i.e. the waste management business, had no experience in that. So our plan was, OK, what did we learn from that plastic injecting molding company with that operator? So what we did was we took two years to learn the business, improve cash flow along the way to make a cash flow positive, and then started probably six months after that, inserting our own people, controllers and different people like that, and then grooming operators from within our place. And that was, that was one that I learned. The other thing that I learned was, that I will share, is that we tried to grow too fast in the automobile business, and we were up to 10 to 12 stores with different manufacturers. And that started to collapse as well, because A, we chose the wrong manufacturer, one that didn't treat us as a, um, just as an employee, basically. Toyota was different. They treat us as a partner. They asked us, what do you need? Other manufacturers didn't. Then the other part of that, of that lesson was that we grew too fast, is that we didn't have the people mm. to really grow. So what we decided to do was invest in people and let the people decide for us if we should go out and inquire so that we can find them a home. Um, so we grow general managers. And then when we grow the general manager, instead of losing them, we go find an opportunity that they can run. And that's how we've been, been successful. So through those particular lessons, the operator part, choosing your partner, um, knowing when to grow, and don't just grow for the sake of growth. You know, um, I'm not on Wall Street, I'm not publicly traded, so I don't have to just grow for the sake of growth, but how do you manage that from that perspective? And um, so that would be a couple. Yeah. Over here. Hi, Jamal. Thanks Hello. for coming out today. Thank you. Um, so often you see players finish their careers and either move in one to two directions. They either go into coaching or they go into becoming a broadcaster or analyst. Did either of those opportunities ever come your way? And if so, why did you choose not to go in that way? And, and what do you just think of all that? Um, yeah, great question. Um, so uh, I was a communication major in college, as I mentioned earlier, and I did do a stint up at uh, 
ESPN for three years. Um, why did I do that? Um, very interesting. Sometimes when you're a professional athlete and you're transitioning, it's hard for other people outside of you who don't know you but view you to transition with you. So what I learned by doing a stand up at ESPN was for three years was A, how to be tight in my communication. They're basically a news channel that just does sports. So their format is news basically, but it's sports. B was, what I noticed was before I did my stand up at ESPN and I got on a plane, people wanted my autograph for what I used to do. But then when I became an ESPN commentator, that became less. They started to want to know of what I knew about the game. And what I found was people started seeing me in my suit and tie talking about the game rather than seeing me in shorts and a t-shirt playing the game. So in their mind, I transitioned just as I transitioned as well. So it was a great tool for me to get people out of the space of what oh. I used to be. And I think a lot of NBA guys or NFL guys transition to that for different reasons. Some of it is they're very good at it. They can talk about the game. They have great insight. Others is that it continues to keep them in the public eye in a lot of regards. Um, then for me, it was just a tool to transition out of it at the end of the day. And I think for me, for coaching, I know what I'm good at. And that's nothing I'm not good at. <laughs> I just don't have the patience. I, I, I'll be honest, I just don't. I coach my son because I love him. But all them other kids, I ain't really love. So like, <laughs> <laughs> all right, we'll do one more question. Okay. Someone over here. Oh, there you go. Hello. Hi. Thanks for speaking with us today. Um, I love the idea of having somebody who's in the car dealership space to talk to you because for me, I'm in the media space and direct to consumer yeah. has basically devastated our the media industry. Yeah. And now we're reeling and we're trying to rebuild it from this much smaller pie. Um, as somebody who is part of the dealers association, what is the thing that's going to bridge that direct to consumer thing that's approaching in the auto space? Well, I, I uh, just from your perspective, obviously, you can't. Yeah, that's, that's a thing. great question. Um, from the dealership perspective, you know, there are certain laws in different states that you, that the manufacturer can't do direct to consumer. They have to have a dealer. Um, you've seen Tesla obviously pop up and different things like that. They have a different model. I think they're more of a, uh, a tech company and uh, more of a um, research and development that happens to do cars. You know, um, I personally think that when I got into the car business, my one biggest thing that I learned or, or noticed was this idea of the shotgun approach to advertising. We would do, we would spend, I want to say, all us probably close to $2 million on advertising. This is local, where we would have radio ads, TV ads, and I'm up in Lexington, Kentucky one day, and I see our ad come on at like 1 o'clock in the morning. I'm like, who's watching this? <laughs> so I challenged our media buy people on what is, if we're spending $400,000 or $200,000 a month, does it really matter if we spend two fifty dollars or one fifty? Can you give me something that I can tie it to? Nobody could. Nobody could. And so what we started to create was a business development arm where we would have our salespeople reach out to customers. And then also we would also sell cars in the service line as well. Because we also know where you're at in your car. I mean, you go to a service, oh, we can get you in a newer model for a lesser payment, blah, 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 blah. And, um, but I do think you have to advertise in different ways. I think social media is, is, is critical. Um, I think being with a boutique agency is probably more critical than a national agency, especially if you understand that particular market. Um, and I do think you have to be very creative in your marketing and advertising and how you go about it. You know, the old way of doing things and engaging customers, 
it's not happening. You know, just to throw up an ad and say you're good at what you do, you got to prove it now. And one thing that we've done in our car dealerships and throughout COVID, and which has been great for us, not from a, I would say more from a marketing standpoint than an advertising standpoint, is that we engaged customers in COVID when everybody else was. Like we weren't charging, you know, 25 grand over sticker because of the supply chain or lack thereof. We stayed true to the pricing. And what we found was when we got out of COVID, the people that bought cars from the dealer that gouge is now coming to us. And we were able to stick with our principles and core values of really taking the customer first. It was a slow approach and everybody was making a lot more money than we did. But then when we got out of COVID, we're the ones that are reaping the benefits of it. Mm -hmm. So I'm a big believer in customer satisfaction. You know, I learned that from Toyota, you know, in a lot of ways. And it's been an interesting journey on the marketing, the advertising and digital platform front, because you have to touch people in different ways. And you have to also remind them that you're there and that you care. And people got to remember, too, back in the day, the car dealer was the pillar of the community. He was the guy everybody came to for donations, football, and all these different things. And you still have to remain true to that. And I think with the, uh, the acquisitions and the roll up with these auto groups, that's become less and less um, because it's become less intimate. It's been about the numbers. Um, so I think the more and more you can engage a customer and be trusted and reliable and transparent, to me, that's where marketing um, becomes at its best. And you, I don't think we'll ever see a particular point where, you're, where somebody's going to call up and call up Ford and get a car. I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think we're going to get to that. There's too many, too many jobs and too many communities that will be lost if that ever happens. Hmm. Are there any student, before we wrap, are there any students who have a question? I have to defer to the students here. There you go. Okay, no pressure, but this is the last question. <laughs> Just introduce yourself, Paul. Um, Colin Smalls, um, played guard on the men's basketball team. Uh, thanks again for coming today. Um, during your time uh, at Kentucky and your early years in the league, what were you, uh, you doing to uh, sharpen your edu uh, entrepreneurial prowess and stay sharp business-wise? Uh, a great question. Um, you know, going from New York City to Lexington, Kentucky, it was culture shock. Um, to say the least, uh, <laughs> um, you know, really what I started to understand about going to the University of Kentucky and um, coming out of New York and what helped me business wise was really understanding cultures, different cultures and different people. And then really understanding also that people are connected at their core for the most part. You know, we may have different way of saying things, a different way of doing things, but ultimately we all want the same thing. And that's to be respected and be loved and be heard. And so for me, you know, really starting going to Kentucky and understanding and what I was dropped into, I had no idea that they were fanatical about basketball in that particular way. I had no idea. <laughs> no clue. And um because back then, there was no, just no idea of it at that particular time. So what I learned was what my, my impact was on that particular university as a player. Not just revenue-wise, but my impact in how I treated people, um, how I responded to people, and also things that I did differently that other people before me didn't do. One thing that I did before I left the University of Kentucky is I set up my own scholarship fund. Um, I endowed the university with $500,000 before I signed my contract for scholarships for kids that looked like me and had a similar story. The criteria for me was single parent home, and you had to have a 2.5. And they were like, why do you want a 2.5? I said, well, I had a 2.5. Um, <laughs> I was one of those kids where if you chatted with me about Two plus two, eh, two dollars plus two dollars, four. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's so with me saying that is I'm probably more beloved now for that scholarship that I endowed and we put 40 kids through school. 
the University of Kentucky and the trade school as well than I am for my basketball career at the University of Kentucky. So I started to understand how all that impacts your reputation. Um, and then with that scholarship, which she runs, Bailey runs now, is that first recipient of the scholarship fund, Dougie Allen, he's been with our MAP organization, I want to say for 17 years or 15 years as our chief operating officer for our Papa John stores. So with that being said, I'm always eyeing talent. And he, was, you know, he wanted to be in a restaurant space. So there's a lot of things that I learned at the University of Kentucky by just observing what I was in and how I can impact it that led me to walking into my MBA career. When I went to the Dallas Mavericks, I looked at my Kentucky experience and realized that my Kentucky experience was much more professional than my Dallas Maverick experience. Mm. And they were a losing team with a losing culture. And I was able to identify that. And when you walk in something, take it all in because you're not going to walk into similar situations similar to this, but you can identify the differences and what, what actually sticks, you know? So just being aware, you know, and understanding what I'm in and how it impacts my reputation and how people view me. And that leads to opportunities as well. Well, this has been great. Thank you so much Thank for you. your time. I, I really enjoyed it. And I know this, uh, this group did as well. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is J.M. Capero. I'm the Director of Athletics and Recreation here on campus at AU. And uh, Jamal, I just have to say that as a lifelong Nets fan and a team employee for 12 years, it's so much nicer seeing you in street clothes. <laughs> oh, shit. Thank you. Uh, and just a quick shameless plug, we've got 297 of some of the best student athletes in this country. Uh, and they, too, are looking out for their own briefcase. Mm. So please, come out to our games. Uh, just support them any way that you can, whenever you can. It's greatly appreciated. Uh, and then just a few thank yous before I let everyone go. I want to thank uh, Dave, Dean Marchick, and the Kogod School and the Science Institute for putting on this incredible uh, event conversation. And then um, a special thank you to both Jamal and Jason. And fellas, when, when, when you give your time to AU, we don't think that you should leave empty-handed. All right, so hold on one sec. So we got some, we got some personalized jerseys. I think, I think we got the right numbers. Yeah, you got, why is he one? <laughs> <laughs> he was the host. <laughs> Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you all very much again for coming and enjoy the rest of family weekend.